going to backtrack out of this just one click. What I did, Google is my friend, is I literally just searched on Google for capturing motion. And the first thing I wanted to show you was there are a lot of websites, you see here, about how to approach capturing motion in your photography. And we'll just start with the, the first one up here, which I haven't visited before. Wow, there's a nice, there's a nice shot. Um, and you can go through, I'm not gonna read this, that's sort of ridiculous. Now he's, okay, we're talking about two primary techniques for capturing motion. Blurred subject with background and focus. Now this happens to be a night or a dusk shot. Same thing happens during the day, sometimes not quite so dramatic, but sometimes it is. The camera is still during a long exposure. Now in this particular shot here, we're seeing the headlights of, mostly we're seeing the white headlights or yellow headlights of cars approaching the camera. Looking at the trails of light, my suggestion is, unless he tells us, I don't think so, that the exposure is probably five seconds or a bit longer. You cannot hold any camera for five seconds exposure while the shutter is open and have the buildings in the background or whatever's in the background as tack sharp as that. Well, they're not perfectly sharp. There'll be way too much movement. Uh, you're just not a steady rock. So obviously it was braced on something, uh, most likely a tripod, but it could have been a bench. It could have been anything that allows the camera to stay still during the five seconds. Whatever moves gets blurred. Now, because it's uh, night, the headlights show up, the car bodies almost don't. They're all in motion. And the last thing I want to show you on this shot is that in the background toward the buildings, you see red. That's the taillights of cars going in the other direction, reddish, reddish orange. That's just one example. Uh, camera is basically set up not to move. The exposure, well, that depends on your subject. In this case, a night shot, it's in seconds, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that long. Here's one that I always point to that can even be done well. It could be done if you're living downtown and you're willing to go in the metro. It's really nice um, in the sense that the background is blurred, but the woman on the metro station is tack sharp, as is the platform. So we know the train's moving, and yet we see enough, just enough detail uh, to note that it's a metro car going by. Now, again, depending on what part of the platform you stand on, exposures could be longer or shorter. If you, you know, the middle of the platform is not bad, but the end of the platform in which the... Um, metro cars come in is where they come in the fastest. And you're definitely gonna get blurred action on the cars, even with um, a 30th of a second, possibly a 60th of a second, and you will still get much of a blur effect like this. Now, during the exposure, the woman is standing still naturally. You focused uh, probably on her, she's nice and sharp and the train is blurred because it's moving so fast. If at the other end of the platform where it stops, well, just before it stops, it's hardly moving. In order to get some blur, you'd literally have to be back to maybe a second or two seconds exposure to get any blur at all. So you have to choose where the lighting is good on the platform because it varies according to the ceiling lights. And you have to choose, you have to experiment. So, this is subject in focus, but background blurred. Here's blurred background with subject in focus. Now this is the example of panning, a panning motion to capture this type of action. I've described it in class and I've described it before, uh, I believe online and it's in the PDF. This is one of the more difficult ones. 
I used to ask the class to show me all three examples. I've dropped that. You can practice it. It's a good idea to get this technique into your uh, bag of tricks. Once again, you're taking a fairly long exposure. Um, and again, it depends on the conditions, how much. This sort of looks like, I can't be sure, but it looks like a night shot. And so this might be a second or two second exposure, possibly to get this. The difference is in this particular case, the camera follows or tracks the action. You literally frame the subject before they get to this position as they're coming into the area where you are. And you follow the action. And you're constant in this shot, you're concentrating on the guy in the middle. And you're trying to keep him in the same part of the frame as he's moving. So you have a smooth swing of the camera, trying not to move the camera up or down during the swing, but simply left or right. Uh, in this particular case, it would be right to left, but it could be the reverse. When they get the closest to you, in most cases, you gently press the shutter button for that one, or, uh, one second exposure, half a second, whatever. And you follow through. You don't try to stop the camera because you'll jerk the camera and you'll get some weird effects. And you may have to practice this a few times. I myself, I haven't done a panning shot for many months, many months. And if I do that, I'm going to have to practice myself to get that smooth swing down and the timing just right. The idea is if you can keep the subject or most of the subject pretty stationary in the same spot in your viewfinder, they will record that way, fairly sharp. But of course, the background is zooming by and it will be blurred. Now that's how you get them to basically stand out from the background. Now they won't be perfectly sharp. You're not a robot or an Android. Um, what's this one? No, I don't want to touch that one, I want to touch that one or that one. You can check this out. Um, let's go back and see if there are better examples because there is, of course, the one that most people are familiar with about capturing motion. Okay, so we've done camera stationary, subject moving. So the subject is blurred. Um, We've done panning, which is the most difficult. The camera is moving with the subject on a slow sp shutter speed. So the car, okay, let's, let's go here because that's a, a nice example. Oh, well, here we are, top of the whole page. That's frozen motion, fast shutter speed. That's what we haven't talked about. But down here, I wonder if they blow up. Uh, no, they don't. But you, you definitely can see here on the left, that sports car, it's not perfectly sharp. It is slightly blurred because we're only human. The rule is simply the subject is sharper than the background. I consider the shot on the left a very good shot. Well done. Um, I believe I showed the class a shot where subject was actually pretty blurred, but not as much as the background. It almost became an abstract uh, image. I wonder if he, um, that's frozen. Yeah, that doesn't go too far. So here on top is the third way, which is to pick a fast enough shutter speed under the lighting conditions to literally freeze the action like we have this surfer who's cut across back into the wave and is now up in the air. And you can see the individual droplets of water. This is something that's implied to your eye, but you don't really see the detail because it's so quick, it just happens, it's done. So you get the impression of the water droplets, but you don't see the detail like this. That's what the camera can do with a fast enough shutter speed. How fast? That depends on the lighting conditions. I would suggest not going for uh, what we call a high speed shot in low light conditions. You're stacking the odds against you. You need a fair amount of light uh, for this. 
in order to choose. Now, what was the shutter speed here? In this particular case, I can't tell you. Um, I will leave you a tip though. There's an interesting thing. Is it, and again, it's sort of a cheat, but it's used by professional photographers all the time who shoot action, sports, and so forth. And many action, not every action shot. There's a peak of the action where the subject is actually hardly moving. Now, in this particular case, it could be that this surfer, that's as high as he got in the air. So for a brief fraction of a second, he's literally hanging there. And you don't need a super fast shutter speed because he's hardly moving. Uh, same thing in basketball. If somebody's going for a layup there is a moment in which he is moving, but not much. It's not the beginning of the jump for the layup. It's near the top of the layup where he's hanging briefly in the air. Of course, it's more dramatic when his hand and the ball are near the hoop. So not only does it let you get away with a slightly slower shutter speed indoors on court where sometimes the lighting isn't that great, but you can, uh, capture it with a bit more interest than at the start of the jump. So you can keep that in motion. Uh, capture in motion by freezing the subject with a high enough. And again, it depends. We're not going to have uh, the F1 um, auto racing here in Montreal this summer because of the pandemic. I don't think. And if you were to go out to the track, though, on any other year to try to photograph it, there are a couple ways that you obviously can do it. We've already gone through them. But if you wish to freeze the car while it's running uh, around the track, the easiest way is literally position yourself, if you can, in a corner, a sharp corner on the track if you're allowed access. Why? Because that's where the cars are the slowest. And therefore you can get away with a uh, slower shutter speed. But if you're on the grandstand stretch uh, there, those cars can hit 200 kilometers an hour or more accelerating. You're gonna need a very fast speed to capture it. I'm talking about a thousandth of a second, maybe as high as a four thousandth of a second such a brief instant in time but otherwise you'll get blur now nothing wrong with that if everything else is sharp but if you're going for frozen motion that's not the best place for it unless you ha you happen to be right up against the end of the grandstand run rail and you're getting the cars coming toward you because action that goes away from an, a camera or toward it does not move that much in the viewfinder. It gets larger or smaller, but it's not the same thing as it going left to right or right to left. Or for that matter, up to down. So again, uh, were you able, were you a track photographer? Because I don't think you can get down right next to the safety railings otherwise. Um, you could in fact capture the start of the race where they're all accelerating from the grid into the first corner. Number one, they haven't reached top speed. They, two, they're slowing down for the corner. And three, they're coming toward you. So maybe you can get away with shooting that shot at uh, 200th of a second. Whereas any other conditions, simply not possible. Now what I did, well, let's let's go back. I want one more thing. Okay, oh, there's my arrow. Um, yeah, so these are all the websites that, oh, and videos that, uh, here's a panning photography video. You can definitely take a look at this and um, these videos will help you along while you're doing it. Okay, so, but let's get out of here and just take a quick look at images. And I do mean very quick. And here see all sorts of examples of capturing motion. Um, freezing it, I believe this one, yeah, spinning wet tennis ball, high shutter speed. They don't tell us what it is. 
but you'd never see the droplets otherwise. Uh, let me look for a good, um, well, there's that shot. Uh, food photography. Um, here we have, I'm not sure, but I believe it would be salt. I'm uh, sorry, sugar. I wouldn't put it on that. It looks like dessert. You see it's frozen in midair, a spray of sugar. Um, probably, okay, now this is capture in motion. Ah, we don't want to see that. Well, there you go. That's a greyhound and a rabbit. Not great. Um, I did a couple shots like this. These are, uh, you know, these little fairs that used to come by, not this year, set themselves up in a major parking lot and you can go in there and there are these rides at night with the neon lights. You see all sorts of different examples. Uh, they're almost all moving. And so you get intricate, interesting patterns uh, like you see here from the neon. But here's one that was taken at dusk. Very interesting in that the central column of the ride is sharp. It was focused on, it's not moving. The wheel on top to which these chairs are attached is moving. Uh, there's a slight bit of blur there. Because the sky is still fairly well lit, we are getting some um, sky in here with color and substance. That's nice instead of black. And the people, it depends, but most of them are blurred because they're all moving. So that, that's a very interesting shot for blurred motion, blurred motion. I'm looking for, what am I looking for? Well, here's a panning shot. Not the best, but let's see what else do we have here. Oh, here's, oh yeah, here's a good one, I think. Yeah, that's a really good one. That's not bad at all. Again, the camera motion followed the car before uh, maybe a second or two or maybe three seconds even before it came into where you wanted to shoot. It slightly passed directly uh, across from the photographer. And they held the camera pretty steady. The car is pretty sharp, but you'll notice the wheels, which are moving in a different circular direction, are blurred. That's normal. Um, but they managed to get a real nice blur on the background. So that one worked out. Now, the car itself doesn't show up a whole lot, but just enough. I mean, it looks like a black car or a dark blue car. We don't see detail toward the end. But we see enough for the body shape. Uh, and that's all we really need in this. What, what's nice is these uh, offices or whatever they are, are tungsten or whatever lit, they're coming out yellow pretty much. We get it on a, a wet surface. So we see reflections to the left also in yellow. Uh, let's see if I can find, I'm still looking for it. No, never mind that one. Um, well, here's an example. Now this is a setup shot in the photographer saw this open doorway and that were people were occasionally um, moving by. So he decided to use the open doorway as a frame. And he probably did one or two exposures to make sure he got his uh, exposure down on a relatively long exposure. Now this one, considering it's a walking motion, I would say it could be half to a, a quarter of a second. Uh, the exposure was based on what's outside, obviously not what's inside. And just waited for somebody to come by. Now he may have shot four or five, six times. He was looking for someone that he could capture pretty much in the center of the frame. And so he got it with this and, and they happened to turn and look at him. Like, what's this guy doing? And is he going to jump me? Now, there we go. Uh, one other, okay, never mind that. What else we got? All sorts of different subjects where one can capture motion. Some are really tricky to do, and I wouldn't try them unless you get a lot of time on your hands. Here's a shot. It's just a droplet of water falling into uh, water. And we're catching uh, 
the shape and the rebound droplets that come out. Timing is everything on this. Now you could shoot a couple of dozen shots before you got this. You're either gonna be too quick on the trigger or too slow on the trigger. Uh, but it can be done if you're patient. Uh, there are ways of uh, triggering your, uh, well, actually even, even your cell phone can be set up on a, a tripod uh, to focus on this area. But you have to buy some equipment. So here we're talking about a bit more money to do this type of uh, work. Um, so we won't really get into that. But it could be done, like I said, just by being uh, patient and working on it. Um, oh, here's a traditional example. Blech. Oh, come on. Aha. This is a stock photo. You see a uh, Shutterstock written there? I actually a member of Shutterstock. It hasn't earned me any money yet because I haven't really uh, concentrated. This is, that's an image bank, if I, I believe I described them. They're all over the place. See, a lot of companies or individuals don't want to hire a photographer anymore. Um, they would rather license an image for what we call uh, image banks. And these are companies that are set up that collect images from photographers. They enter into agreement, or the photographer does with them, to allow the images the photographer submits to be rented out at different price ranges. Depends on, well, it depends on, uh, what the image is going to be used for, is it an annual report? Is it part of a billboard campaign? Is it part of a PR pamphlet? Each one of those has a, a different price. Uh, is it a one-time use only? One billboard once, up for three months? That's one price. I want to use it four or five times. I want to use it on a billboard. The company's annual report pamphlet that up my website, these are all different prices. And the photographer gets a percentage of what Shutterstock collects from the company or individual. A very small percentage, I might say. But there are photographers who shoot specifically for places like Shutterstock and so forth. Uh, image bank photography, it's called. They, um, they check to see and like Shutterstock and others will actually, for their members, send out emails saying, these are the hottest photos uh, for the last month. And the photographer can look at it and go, oh. So they're, they're capturing uh, motion, you know, like this, this one, which I don't consider to be the greatest shot. Uh, that's the hot thing now. I'm gonna shoot some and offer it to Shutterstock. But there are some photographers who make a comfortable living uh, doing that, but they're few and far between. You have to use more than one company. Anyway, let's stop on that. Um, this is a motion capture shot. This is a time exposure. Uh, you can see how blurred the water is close to the camera. And as you get further into the shot, there's less blur. I don't mean the rocks, but I mean the water. And the reason for that is again, the closer you have of a subject moving near the camera, the more blurred it will be on a time exposure. I can't guess on that. So, and besides that isn't, ugh, I don't really like that shot. It's not very good. This one might be better in black and white. Yeah, it's a bit better. Uh, driftwood on a beach, maybe clouded day, uh, which allows for, uh, slower shutter speed and you see the wave breaking and the swirl of the water this is pretty nice and again you can see the majority of the blur is where the wave hits the log and where we're really close to the camera as you move further away things appear sharper they're still moving the water it's just that they don't move as much in the frame further away and the water closest does and you'll notice that the logs and of course, the mountains to the left are perfectly sharp. They're not moving. 
So, and this was converted to black and white. And traditional waterfall, yeah, that's not a good shot. That's not a good shot, but that's a kind of a traditional thing too that you'll see. Um, let's just go and change it from capturing motion to long exposure. Can I spell? Yeah, I can. Long exposure photography, which is one area that some people really love to uh, work in. And I'm just actually starting in seriously on long exposure photography. So much so that I, I bought uh, a neutral density uh, filter to block light. Now we get shots, come on. We get shots like this. I don't know if I'll ever get a shot like that. But I concentrate mostly on nature and landscape, less on people. And I've decided that I really like some long exposure work. And this is an example of what I would like to be doing. And the problem with doing it is getting a long enough exposure without overexposing everything to, so it just goes white in most places. Now, here you can take a look at the water that's breaking right at the foot of the cliff, and there's no detail. Why? Because the exposure, and I maybe could go to the website and find out, but I suggest the exposure was probably 30 seconds, somewhere around there. And during those 30 seconds, we had multiple waves break on the shore, and they all recorded and it started to become a uh, detail less mist. And that's what that effect is. And again, further back in, way back into the scene, um, if you just cover the lower two thirds of it, you can almost think it was a uh, very fast exposure. Everything looks sharp, but it's so far away you can't tell. What's close up, aside from the cliff, the cliff edge, which we see is soft. Now again, a 30 second exposure while the sun is just setting under these conditions, it's not possible with any camera specifically without additional help. Now my Fuji uh, X100F does have a built-in neutral density filter, but it's only three stops. That doesn't block quite enough light. So, I had to go buy uh, a variable neutral density filter. Now here's a question, because I've sort of lost track. I don't think I showed you folks that. Anybody here want to uh, tell me, did I show you folks my neutral density filter in the last uh, time we, we met? Come on folks, speak up. Do you remember any of that? I probably didn't. Uh, it would be worthwhile to pick it up and bring it here. We probably do have a little time if I still have some people here, and I'll show you the effect of it. A neutral density filter simply is gray, or is supposed to be gray. All it's supposed to do is block light, so that you have to compensate by going to a longer exposure. Now, the one that's built into my camera was, isn't quite enough for something like this, wasn't quite enough for the scenes that I shot uh, here in my forest of the creek that's going over a waterfall. So I pulled out my neutral density filter. Now there are different strengths from blocking just a bit of light to blocking 90% you know, of the light. It's almost so dark you can't see through it. It gets expensive to buy multiples, but so what I did is I bought a special type, which is called a variable neutral density filter. You can look it up on uh, Amazon and you'll see all sorts. It's essentially two uh, polarizing filters stacked on each other. So you can twist, once you mount it on your camera lens, you can twist one of them. And what that does is vary the amount of light that's blocked. Uh, in this particular case, I believe, I'd have to look at it. Uh, it starts blocking at three stops of light. 
and goes all the way up to eight stops of light. Now for the shots, which I will show you by posting of my stream uh, down below, I, I took a, of a waterfall. And the series is a fairly fast frozen motion of the waterfall. So you can see details in the water fall. It's a very small waterfall, by the way. It's like uh, two feet. It's a small creek. Um, I didn't build it. My, my neighbor did it uh, years ago. But still, it captures frozen motion. And then I slapped on the filters and I started going progressively longer exposures until I ended up with a 30 second, I think it was 30 or 28 second exposure where the water is extremely blurred, but the rocks are perfectly sharp. And I will uh, edit them and put them together probably in a PDF. I mean, I'd show them to you today if they're ready, but like I said, they're not on my iPad. So that. I think I'll not run for my filter, um, perhaps show it to you next time, just because it's interesting. Um, if you get into this type of long exposure photography, uh, we'll forget astrophotography. Some of these shots here are beautiful, but uh, oh, that one is not all that sharp. I wonder, ugh, we can forget that one. Oh, here's an interesting shot. All right, let me figure out how they did this. Okay. All right. Somebody's got a hot car. Can't recognize exactly what it is, but I can't afford it. I had a friend with a hot car set the camera on a tripod. You got it. And dialed in a particular exposure. I'm guessing that it was probably about five seconds. That would be about right. Now to get it all in focus, because we're looking at not only the car, uh, California, of course, license plate, of course it'd be California license plate. <laughs> uh, nice and, sh well, relatively sharp. And yet even the trees in the distance fairly sharp. They had to set sort of a middle F stop, like F8. There are some tricks about keeping everything sharp under the circumstances. I won't go too far into it. Um, the driver's car window was probably open, so he could get instructions. Um, he would just sit in there idling until the photographer was uh, ready to trigger the camera. And then he simply said, go, Joe, and click the shutter. And initially, the bright tail lights and the license plate light imaged the back of the car fairly sharp, and he moved. And now we're getting the street. And notice that he was slaloming left to right. See the S curves off into the distance? And it was the headlights that lit the trees. Now, there's probably some editing on this shot in the sense that for color balance, maybe not much. Those are about, that's about the right color for tail lights. Those are LED tail lights. And he probably had LED headlights. So they might have matched because these are uh, white LEDs in the tail lights. Uh, it's just the covering lens that makes them red. And so, but basically what you would do is you'd end up with a shot somewhat like this and be really, I would, I think it's a great shot, uh, probably highly illegal too, but it might've been on private property, so it's not illegal. Um, and I would balance for the trees, which are pretty neutral. So we get shots like that, possibly five seconds. So it's capable. When you capture motion, it's capable of producing some really amazing shots. Now, here's one that I'll bring up. Oh, it's low resolution, unfortunately. Star trails in a circle. Why? Because they're circling the North Star. The North Star in our hemisphere is the point at which the stars seem to circle. It's not perfectly true, but it's so close to the North Star that that's what photographers do. 
How long is this exposure? Well, they're certainly not complete circles. Notice that the trails are fairly short. There are just a lot of them. This was taken after the sun was down for over half an hour. There's still some light in the sky, but not much. Um, this might have been 20 minutes. I'm, I don't do astrophotography. I have a scope. I just don't practice photography with it. Um, so it was not a super long exposure, but the center of the image was centered on the North Star. So that's why they appear to circle in that area. Spe oh, yeah, really getting off. It's five o'clock, we still have um, a little more time. I'll show you something here, really interesting. Is this also low res? Yeah, I hate it. See how it seems soft? It's just because it doesn't have enough pixels. But you get the idea. What we have here is ambient light. There was enough light left that during the uh, relatively long exposure, we pick up the surrounding area. But I'm pretty sure this was done late in dusk. But I'm not too sure. Now, it's artificial light on this old rusted abandoned uh, bus, car, delivery wagon, whatever. Now, you, see, you will see a lot of this. And I do find it fascinating when it's done right. This one um, is not a great example because they didn't upload their high resolution image. Uh, on the interior of the truck, <clears throat> they have a red gelled light of some sort. Now it's possible it could be a remotely triggered flash, but it could just as easily be a uh, sort of a broad flood-like uh, flashlight, gelled red. Um, and then on the front of the truck with this blue, some sort of other artificial light that is also uh, blue gelled. And so that's how they got that false color in there, but this is not as nice or dramatic as I've seen. I've seen some absolutely gorgeous stuff done that way. So you just go through all the examples and get rid of the things that you um, are technically too difficult, can't figure out how they're done. And there, believe it or not, there's some that are done that I can't figure out exactly how they did it. Uh, oh, here's another one. Oh, good. This one actually resolves pretty nicely. We're seeing um, the Milky Way in the sky. That's that band, that arc there. It's one arm of our universe um, that we can see. This was taken obviously at night. Uh, there's a possibly a little bit of glow to the right. Now that could be because there was just a touch of glow left from the sunset. It might also be a glow from uh, a city 20 or 30 miles away. Now, I don't think you can get a shot done like this just with your camera without extra equipment. Now, the lighting on the road are just cars, either coming toward us, which give us the white streaks, or moving away, we get the tail lights, which are red. But what's more interesting is, and there's enough of that traffic that it's lighting up what looked like are these snow banks. Yeah, I think there's snow banks on the right and a little bit of the tree line, which is nice. It's not a full silhouette. The problem of trying to get this straight out of your uh, camera is, of course, the movement of the Earth. The stars actually don't move relative to us. I mean, they move, but we can't tell. But the Earth spins. And although you can't see it, um, it's there, and about the longest, it depends on the lens you have, but about the longest exposure you can go on most cameras, if you don't have a telephoto lens on there, just sort of a standard lens, is somewhere between 20 and 40 seconds. The 40 second mark, depending on the lens, you're gonna see some star trails. You won't see these beautiful pinpoints of light. It's worth trying sometime. Of course, you got to be in a tripod. Um, make sure that camera's rock steady. And it's got to be well after sunset so we don't get sky glow 
and preferably not, and well, you can't do this in the city. There's way too much contamination light from the city to even be able to see the stars uh, to speak of. That's the problem with living in the city. You're gonna have to move, set up 50 miles, uh, well, at least 70 kilometers from Montreal or other major cities to get away. Go up in Laurentians, you'll see beautiful skies. It may have been, no, it wasn't, absolutely. I just realized I was about to bark up the wrong tree. I was about to describe a piece of equipment that astrophotographers use, but they didn't use it for this shot. You know why I know? Unless they got real tricky with Photoshop and combined two images, there's no blur on the tree line. So the camera didn't move with the stars. So this was at the very least captured in camera and then enhanced in editing. Uh, when you are looking at a star shot, I might be able to find one while we're going through these. Uh, well, I could search for it since we're off on this tangent here. Hey, it is a long exposure. Um, I'm just gonna um, change this from long exposure uh, star photography. There you go. Let's see what comes up. Well, we get our spins all around the North Star, as you see. Um, the advantage of working that type of shot is, of course, it needs to be a bit more than just uh, the stars spinning. Again, this is low res. We need the silhouettes of the trees there to make it more interesting. Circles themselves are not all that great. Uh, ooh, that's interesting, blood moon. Uh, okay, here's where, um, here's where the photographer set up for, um, come on, get up there, there we go. Uh, a shot, interesting shot because not only did he get the star trails, he was not focused uh, or framing on the North Star, so we're getting arcs. He's getting reflections in the water in front of him near the camera, which adds interest to the foreground. But the big streak, there's the moon moving, because the moon moves too. It circles around Earth. Um, it does so on the same plane as the stars, so it generally follows the same direction. That was rather interesting. Um, -bum -bum. What am I looking for? Well, a little bit hard to tracking. A lot of these include foreground, and if the foreground or earthly bounds things are in fact sharp, they didn't use that specialized equipment called a star. Well, it's called various things: star tracker. Um, Let's see what this one is. It's not very really good either, so I don't want to do that. Well, okay. Oh, another low res image. But here's an interesting one that combines um, a moderately long exposure, about 20 minutes, um, at night. Truly dark in the sky. We're getting just a touch of uh, sun glow over the uh, ridge. We are also getting what appears to be a city or I'm not sure to the right what I'm looking at. And then we have this, um, looks like a church, small chapel, which is being lit by the light inside of it. So this is a bit of a tricky one to get. And never mind the softness, that's because they, they didn't want somebody stealing their high res, they gave us a low resolution one. And the exposure according to the star trails, probably about 20, 30 minutes, I'm guessing. Um, Anyway, a star tracker is literally something that you mount on your tripod and then you mount your camera on it. And you have to do a calibration to the North Star. The idea being that as the Earth turns, the camera star tracker turns to hold the stars steady despite the fact that they would normally make trails. So anything that's on the ground that's included would end up being blurred. And so that's why you don't see that. I'm gonna bring this one up. This one's really neat. Yeah. Night sky, long exposure. 
we're seeing two, at least two effects on this one. Uh, I like the fact, now this might have been done afterwards in post. It may not have been all blue like this. We might have had other colors in it of some sort. However, the photographer undoubtedly felt that they were distracting. So he turned it to black and white, and then he introduced this cold blue, which I really like with the scene. The beautiful rock formations. We have moving water, breaking water in that, but the long exposure has blurred it. So as you can see, there's practically no detail there. And the clouds are blurred, as you can see. Again, a sign of a long exposure. So it's quite capable, these long exposures of producing some very nice stuff. All right, you can go through and pick out uh, stuff you like. Um, some of this, of course, I'm doing star photography. That's really a subject that's not part of the course, and I'm just putting it up there because you might like it uh, here when you do long. And again, if you do panning uh, photography, you'll get examples of that. So just about anything that we discuss in class can be found examples on Google. Some are easy, some are hard to do. And some are a bit difficult because, of course, with Photoshop and everything else, it can be a multiple layer stacked photograph. It can have all sorts of tricks built in. And we're not going down that path on that one. Okay, uh, that's enough. Stop broadcasting. And let's get back and see if I've got anybody left. But hey, I kept six people, didn't get all that bored, five people, including myself. At this point, since we are finishing up uh, for today, <sighs> take a quick breather. Me, I'm an addict, I'll light a cigarette. And I'll ask, do you have any questions about anything, really? I can't advise you on the stock market, but... Gee, no questions. All right. Now, I have already, just before you go, I, I, I do have another Zoom video. Okay, I've recorded this one, the majority of it. I'll try to edit it. But there's another one that's already in the can. I just have to edit, put it up, dealing with one of the assignments. I just kind of forgot. Which one.